Romans 6.11 says, so you too consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Uh, Verse 11 is the first commandment in the book of Romans. And I find it fascinating that the first command is not a command to go to church or read your Bible or give to the poor. The first command has to do with how you think about yourself. Paul really wants us to see ourselves the way that God sees us. He wants to see, see ourselves. He wants us to see ourselves as we really are. And so I want to ask you this morning, uh, when you look at yourself in the mirror, what do you see? What do you see? And when you think about yourself, what do you think? Human beings relate to one another largely by looking at each other. It's very difficult to feel close and connected to someone without making eye contact. And if someone won't look you in the eye, it makes you feel uncomfortable. And in the same way, we relate to God largely by looking at him and he at us. If we will not look at God, it is very difficult for us to know God and walk with God. And when God looks at you, what does he see? When the Lord Jesus Christ looks at you, what does he see? Well, he sees a dearly loved child who's been adopted into his family. If you're a Christian, you've been born again by the grace of God, he sees a dearly loved child who's been adopted into his family. He sees a forgiven saint washed clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. He sees a new creation clothed in the righteousness of God. He sees a co-heir with Christ, one who is being made fit to reign with him over all things. And he sees someone who is dead to sin and alive to God. And so who am I? Who am I? Well, we are to think I am dead to sin and alive to God. I have died with Christ. My old life is over and my new life in Christ has come. The big question the Apostle Paul is answering in Romans chapter 6 is the question, how do you fight sin and live righteously in a fallen world? Many were saying that the gospel of grace promoted sin. Paul says, no, no, no. It's the grace of God that teaches us to say no to sin. It's the grace of God that teaches us how to live righteously. And so how do we fight sin and live righteously in a fallen world? Well, the first instruction is consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. And I want to give you three reasons we need to obey this command. And we need to understand the difficulty of obeying this command. There are many challenges because this is not a command to just show up at church. It's not a command to pray for five minutes a day. It is a command regarding how you think about yourself. This is a command that we are to obey day after day until, the Lord, until we see the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there are many difficulties in obeying this command. And so I want to give you three reasons to help us think through why we need to obey this command. Number one, it's that you are dead to sin and alive to God. Why should you believe that two plus two is four? Because it's true. It's true. And why should you believe, if you're a Christian, why should you believe that you're dead to sin and alive to God? Because it's true. This is who you are. And Paul does not intend for this truth to be some abstract, ethereal concept in a textbook. That's not his goal. Uh, This truth is designed to be deeply practical. It's designed to fill our hearts with hope. Uh, A summary of Paul's argument in chapter 6 goes like this. This is what he's saying. You track his argument all throughout chapter 6. This is what he's saying. Since you are dead to sin and alive to God, you will fight sin and live righteously. Since you are dead to sin and alive to God, you will fight sin and live righteously. If you ask the Apostle Paul, you got coffee with the Apostle Paul, and you said, oh, Paul, man, it is difficult to live righteously. It is difficult to obey God. There's so many temptations in life, and I feel like I'm overpowered by sin at times. So how do I fight sin and live righteously? Paul would look at you and say, you will. That's the answer. You will. You will. Now, how can he say that? That's not a very good answer. Uh, It doesn't help us immediately. But he's just saying, no, no, you will. If you're a Christian, you will. Romans 6.14, for sin will not rule over you. Sin, for sin will not rule over you. How can Paul write this to the Romans, Roman Christians, without knowing them personally? He doesn't know them. How can he say, for sin will not rule over you? Is it because... They're so smart. Is Paul going to say, you know, you guys are so smart. You're going to outsmart sin. You're so wise. You're going you're, you're to figure out a way to get away from sin. You're so strong, so you're going to overpower sin. You know, you're so consistent. You're going to outlast sin. Or you're so pretty. You're just going to woo sin into submission. Is that, is that why sin will not be your master? Well, no. Look at verse 14. For sin will not rule over you. Why? 
because you are not under the law, but under grace. You are under grace. Praise God. We are not under the law, but under grace. And to be dead in sin and alive to God is to be under grace. We are no longer in Adam. Death no longer reigns, but in Christ, grace reigns. This is what he says in verse 5. He says, For if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So he says, okay, so you died with Christ. You died with Christ. You've been united with Christ. And if you were united with Christ in his death, you will be united with him in his resurrection. Meaning, you will, you will, you will see Christ in glory. And then he goes on to say in verse 6, for... We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin since a person who has died is freed from sin. So he's, he's, he's saying, okay, your future, what is your future? Well, if you've been united with Christ in his death, you will be united with him in his resurrection. If you have been born again, if you have been saved by the grace of God, he will get you to the very end. He will get you to glory. And you might say to yourself, well, okay, okay, if I'm saved now, if I've been justified by grace, and he promises to get me to the end, well, what about this life? Well, he says in verse 6, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin. He says, listen, listen, the whole, the whole of our salvation is by grace. We have been justified by his grace, we are being sanctified by his grace, and we will be glorified by his grace. The grace that saves you, sanctifies you, and it will glorify you. God does not just give you enough grace to forgive your sins. He gives you enough enough grace to get you to the end. This is why he says, sin will not be your master. Because you're you're not under the law, you are under the grace of God. We're justified by his grace, we're sanctified by his grace, and we will be glorified by his grace. Grace. So the first reason you need to believe that you're dead to sin and alive to God is because it's true. It is true. Reason number two, it's that your feelings and the culture will lie to you about who you are. So why do you need to believe this truth? Why do you need to count yourself dead to sin but alive to God? Because your feelings and the culture will lie to you about who you are. I'm not saying that your feelings don't matter in the Christian life. I'm saying that your feelings cannot be your guide in the Christian life. They will lead you astray. And we know this to be true. We know, if we think about it for five minutes, we know that our feelings cannot be our compass. We know that our feelings cannot be our guide as we try to follow Christ. Because there is often a vast discrepancy between how you feel about a situation and the facts of a situation. There's often a vast discrepancy between how you feel about a situation and the facts of a situation. Now, this past winter, I've watched over 100 youth basketball games. It's a lot of games. It's been a lot of fun. And uh, during one of the games, one of my kids asked me the question. He said, hey, hey, Dad, do you think you can touch the rim? That's what he asked. All these boys are getting up grabbing the rim. He goes, hey, Dad, do you think you could touch the rim? Now, just the question itself was probably the greatest compliment I've ever received from my kids. <laughs> because they thought, you know, at least there's a chance. <laughs> at least there's a chance you could touch the rim. And so with that little boost of confidence, I started to think about that question. And I thought, you know what? I used to be able to grab the rim, you know, back in the day, and my legs are practically trampoline. So maybe, maybe I can, maybe I have a chance. And so I waited for everyone to clear out of the gym, obviously, before I tried. And I tried. Now, do you think I can touch the rim? Anyone here believe in me? <laughs> we got one person. <laughs> okay. Not a lot of confidence. But uh, the answer is no, I cannot touch the rim. I tried three times, and uh, I got so close like within 18 inches or so from touching <laughs> the rim. But in my soul, I thought, yeah, yeah, I, can, I think I can do it. Like in my mind, I'm like, oh, I, th- I think I can do it. But in reality, I wasn't really close at all. And we've all had situations where in our mind we think, okay, this is the way something is. I think I can do this. But then we get smacked by reality. And there are so many situations in life where our feelings, even our confidence, our emotions, do not match up with reality. And so in verse 11, Paul says, so you too consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. He does not say you should feel like you're dead to sin. That's not what he says. He says, count yourself. Logizo mai is the Greek word. It's an accounting term. He says, mark it down, count it. You are dead to sin and alive to God. There are many times when you will feel dead to God 
and alive to sin. And he says, no, no, in those situations, don't trust the way you feel, rather consider yourself, count yourself dead to sin and alive to God. So when you think of, uh, when, you, when you ask yourself the question, who am I? You are to say, I am dead to sin and alive to God. If you ask the culture, who am I? You ask our current world, current culture, who am I in Christ? They will likely say something like, you're out of touch. You might even be dangerous. You're so out of touch that you might even be dangerous. You're mindless idiots. Or as Taylor Swift says, you need to calm down. You're being too loud. You need to sit down, you hateful, judgmental bigots who are trapped in the dark ages. And in many schools, this is what you'll hear. On many college campuses, this is what you'll hear. In many workplaces, this is what you'll hear. This is what you'll see. Oftentimes in the movies, this is what you'll hear in modern music. You are dangerous, or you might be dangerous. And if we're not careful over the course of time, we will begin to absorb that narrative into our souls. We will begin to think that, man, maybe we are dangerous. Maybe we are out of touch. Maybe, maybe we don't know what we're talking about. And if, if we start to listen to the world that we live in, or we listen to ourselves, we will be misguided. See, Christians have always been misunderstood. Always. Christians have always been misunderstood. Why? Because our Lord was misunderstood. You, you should think deeply about this reality, that the King of glory, the Son of God, the one full of grace and truth, was misunderstood. Uh, he was labeled a blasphemer. Uh, they saw all that he did and they reached the conclusion he's demon-possessed. He's dangerous. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I mean, this is Christ, the perfect. He is the perfect one, the one who represents God, who is God in the flesh. And so we, we ought to expect that as we follow Christ imperfectly, the world which rejected Christ will at least misunderstand us. And when Paul wrote this letter to the Roman church, the Roman Christians were misunderstood as well. Tacitus, I was reading a little bit about the Roman historian Tacitus this week, and he, he says, or he, he writes about how Roman culture thought about Roman Christians 2,000 years ago. And he said that Roman Christians, or Christians in Rome, were cannibals. How did they think about them? Cannibals, because they ate the body and drank the blood of Christ. Uh, they were accused of committing incest, because they referred to one another as brothers and sisters, and then they would marry each other. Not, they weren't literal brothers and sisters, but they were brothers and sisters in Christ. And so they were cannibals, they committed in incest, and then Tacitus says they were given to deadly superstition, that they were willing to believe in this person, Jesus, all the way to the point of death. Deadly superstition. So brothers and sisters, don't, do not look to yourself to figure out who you are. Do not look to the culture to figure out who you are. Paul says, count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God. My old life is over. My old life of sin is over. It's nailed to the cross, and I have a new life in Christ. So reason number one, you should believe that you're dead to sin and alive to God, because it's true. Reason number two, your feelings in the culture will lie to you about who you are. Reason number three, your life will inevitably follow the path of your clearest and strongest thoughts. That what goes on in your mind shapes all of your life. What happens in your thought life, what you fill your head in, the ideas that become clear and strong, you're going to live them out. And the more you count yourself dead to sin and alive to God, the more you're going to live like you're dead to sin and alive to God. Uh, th this is fighting sin and living righteously at the level of our, of our identity, of who we are. See, Christ has made us new. We are new creation in Christ, and we are to live out of that identity. Augustine, he lived in the fourth century, very influential Christian in relatively early church history. And before he, he came to faith in Christ, he lived a very sexually promiscuous life where he indulged so many of his desires. And uh, the last issue he had to wrestle with before he became a Christian was his sexual appetite. And he, he, he wondered, can I live without my sexual appetites, without indulging my sexual appetites? Well, eventually, he gave his life to Christ. His eyes were opened. He was made a new creation in Christ. 
But in his past life, he had many mistresses, and he had one mistress that he really loved. One mistress he really loved. And so he came to faith in Christ, and he said goodbye to this woman that he was actually living with. And months had gone by, and one day in the market, his mistress decided that she was going to go after him, and she wanted to sleep with him. And so she found him and, and pleaded with Augustine, saying, come sleep with me. And he said, no, and he walked away. Uh, she caught up to him again and said, Augustine, come with me. And he said, no, and walked away. And then a third time, she came to him and said, Augustine, come with me. And he said, no. And then she grabbed him and said, Augustine, it's me. It's me. Now, what do you say to that? He loved her. He was attracted to her. They had a history. And in so many ways, our, our sin temptations, they call out to us. They come after us. They track us down. And in the moment of temptation, how do you fight that battle? Well, Augustine says, this is what he said to her, he said, I know it's you, but it's no longer me. And I think to myself, that is how you fight temptation. That is how you live righteously under the Lord. He's saying that this life of promiscuity that dishonors God I, knew, I know I used to indulge in it, but it's no longer me. That is my old life. That life is dead, nailed to the cross, buried with Christ, never to be resurrected again. And when you believe what God says about you, when you begin to believe what God says about you, it fundamentally changes the nature of temptation because, see, when you, the more and more you believe what Christ says about you and you believe who you are in Christ, the more and more you see sin as something foreign to you. It's not something that belongs to you. It's something alien, separate from you. You begin to see sin as death and corruption for the soul. But see, the more we think, you know what, I'm just a slave to my desires, and the life is found in obeying my desires, then, then, then sin becomes more and more tempting to our lives. So how do you fight sin and live righteously? You must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. Number two, you need to understand the nature of our slavery to sin and freedom in Christ. You need to understand the nature of our slavery to sin and our freedom in Christ. In the, in the scriptures, you see that people had real masters, slave masters. The, the Israelites, they were enslaved to Egypt under, four, under Pharaoh for 400 years. But then you see another type of slavery in the scriptures, and this is slavery to sin. Jesus looked at the Israelites, Jewish people in John chapter 8, and he says, you're slaves to sin. You sin because you're slaves to sin. Now, what in the world does it mean to be enslaved to sin? What does it mean to be a slave to sin? Well, this is, my best, this is my best understanding of what it means. Slavery to sin is offering the parts of your body to your desires. Slavery to sin is offering yourself, your hands, your eyes, your mouth, your ears, your body, <clears throat> your, body your intellect, to your desires. And when I say desires, I'm using the word that, that Paul uses. I have that word in mind. It's the Greek word epithumia. Compound word, prefix, E-P-I. And the prefix, E-P-I, it always intensifies whatever word it's attached to. It's where we get our word epic or intense or over. It means something that's really strong. So epa and thelos, it means desire, your wants, your will. So your epithumias are your over desires, your epic desires, your intense Desires. This is not speaking of your desire for water. If you're thirsty and you say, I want something to drink, and you, you, you satisfy that desire, you drink some water, Paul's not saying you are, you are enslaved to sin because you gave in to that desire. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about your epithumia. He's talking about your over-desire. He's talking about the desires that motivate you to violate God's word. 1 Peter 2.11 Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires, your epithumia, that wage war against the soul. Every Christian has a civil war raging in our souls. If you're a Christian, you have a civil war raging in your soul. The word of God tells us to love God, but we desire to love ourselves. The word of God tells us to speak the truth but we desire to lie. The word of God tells us to be sacrificial in the way we love other people, but we are selfish. God tells us to be generous, but we're greedy. 
God tells us to be sexually pure, but we sin sexually. So to be enslaved to sin simply means we do what we want. That the decision, the chief decision-making factor in any given situation is what we want. It's what we feel like in the flesh. Now, as Christians, we get a new heart with new desires. And so this is why there's a war in the first place. There's the desires which flow from, from Christ, that flow from the Spirit, and then there's the desires of the flesh. And this is where the battle rages. Verse 12 says, therefore, don't let sin reign. Don't let sin be your master. Don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its epithumia, your desires. And this is a particular struggle for us in our culture today. Because in our culture, the individual is king. The individual reigns. And the desires of the individual is at the very top of the priority list. But in the scriptures, this is the epitome of slavery. It is what God has come to save us from. He has come to save us from chasing our own dreams and fulfilling our own desires in our flesh. And you might say, well, isn't, isn't it good to fulfill your dreams and your desires? Well, it might be if it's surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. But these desires, these epithumias, in and of themselves, they will wreak havoc in our lives. And in verse 12, the Apostle Paul, he personifies these epithumias. And he's teaching us that every person has a master. Everyone has a master. So there, there's a, a slide here, if you want to put that slide up. Uh, this is a picture, hypothetically, of me, and, or you, or whatever. And it's easy for us to think this. This is a lie. I am my own master. If you want to go back to that slide. I am my own master. That is not true. That is, a, that is a complete lie. Every human being has a master, at least one master. So what are the masters? Well, here are your epithumias. Uh, here's pride. Pride and anger. If you want to go to the next one, lust, greed, selfishness, bitterness. And the list goes on and on and on. And you might think to yourself, okay, so... Maybe I'm not that greedy, but the picture that we have in the scriptures is that we are absolutely enslaved to sin. We're surrounded by it. So you might think, I'm not that greedy, but how do you defeat your greed? Well, you might defeat your greed by your lust. You say no to greed, but you say no to greed because you said yes to your lust. Or maybe bitterness. Maybe you're not enslaved to bitterness, but how do you defeat bitterness? only by saying yes to self-righteousness. Uh, do, you, do you ever hear people say something like this? You're better than that. Why should you not be bitter? Because you're better than that. You are better than that. And sometimes when I hear that, I think, yeah, you're right, I am better than that, and I'm better than that person. And that's why I'm not gonna be bitter, because I'm better. It's like all you're doing is, you're, quote, defeating bitterness in the name of your own self-righteousness. And so the picture we have in the scriptures is that we are utterly enslaved. We're enslaved. And if you just examine your heart for one moment, you know this to be true. How in the world, how in the world do we defeat our fears? Well, maybe it's through our lust. We just turn from one slave master to the next. Now, why would we ever do this? Why would we offer ourselves to our slave masters? Well, here's a principle we see in the scriptures. Here's the principle. It's that our desires, our epithumia, are liars. And all day long, they're whispering in our ear. All day long, whispering in our heads, putting thoughts in our minds. Our desires are liars, and they're making you promises. They're promising you something. They're hinting at things all day long. Yesterday, I was at Starbucks for a number of hours, and I heard this song on repeat for like four hours or three hours yesterday by the weekend. I'm not very familiar with too many of his songs, but I learned a little bit about him. But this is what he says. He says, and I know she'll be the death of me. At least we'll both be numb. And she's always, or she'll always get the best of me. The worst is yet to come. But at least we'll both be beautiful and stay forever young. That's a lie, obviously. That, this I know. Yeah, this I know. She told me, don't worry about it. She told me, don't worry no more. We both know we can't go without it. She told me, you'll never be in love. 
oh, oh, woo. <laughs> and then she says, or he says, I can't feel my face when I'm with you. Now, doesn't that sound like a medical emergency? <laughs> That's a, you need to go to the hospital. But um, I can't feel my face when I'm with you, but I love it. But I love it. Oh, I can't feel my face with you. And he just repeats that over and over and over again. Now, I'm not entirely sure what Mr. Weekend is saying here <laughs> in the song. <laughs> But I think I know. Um, I'm pretty sure he's talking about drugs. He's talking about doing cocaine or whatever it is. And some of the other parts of the song, I think he's talking about love and sexual pleasure. I mean, he is an empty man, and he knows he's empty, and he's trying to fill his life with sex and drugs. And he says, he goes, I know she'll be the death of me. I know it. But he says, I don't know what else to do. Maybe there's life in this. Maybe there's life in this. And this is the way all of our epithumias work. This is the way our greed works, our pride works, our fear works, our anxiety works. It all, all of our desires are constantly lying to us over and over and over and over and over again. And we believe that there's life in them. That there is life in the fulfillment of our desires. This is the original sin in the Garden of Eden. Adam believed that there was life outside of God, outside of God's word. And so we offer ourselves to our masters, our slave masters. And Paul is saying in verse 13, and do not offer any parts of it as weapons for unrighteousness. I love that he uses the word weapons. Because Paul's like, this is a war. This is a battle that we're in. That life is really not a game. There's a lot of fun and a lot of joy. But life is really serious. It is really serious. And he says, don't offer any parts of it, of your body, to sin as weapons for unrighteousness. Why? Because they're liars. They're liars. They're cruel masters. I mean, how often do you give in to fear for a day? And the next day you say to yourself, I'm really happy I was dominated by fear all day. <laughs> well, how many times do you give in to your lust, your sexual desires for sexual sin, and the next day you think, I am so grateful I did that. I'm so grateful I looked at that. You don't think that. How many times have you been greedy and selfish and you thought, man, it just feels so good to take advantage of people? It doesn't work that way. In the moment, we, we are deceived our, by our own hearts. And Paul says, don't, don't give yourself to them. Don't give yourself to your masters. And if you start to think about what people do with their hands, I mean, just think for a moment. What do people do with their hands when they're submitted to, to anger? I mean, just, just do that thought experiment. When people have rage in their heart, what do they do with their hands? And what do they do with their words? And when people are bitter, what comes out of their mouth? And you can go up and down, up and down, all the different epithumias that we all wrestle with. And he says, don't give any of yourself, none of yourself to them. They are unworthy masters that only bring death. They are liars. And you think about the transgender revolution that's going on in our culture. And I was, th I was thinking about what's happening this week through the light of Romans chapter 6. And what's happening is that there are people with serious mental health issues. And they are submitting themselves, their bodies, to their masters. Masters of lust and pride. And they are literally mutilating themselves. Mutilating their genitals mutilating their bodies as the ultimate act of saying, I am who I am. You remember God at the burning bush, Yahweh? He says, I am who I am. But when someone says I'm transgender, they're saying, no, you're not. I am who I am. You do not define me, I define me. And I will offer my body on the altar of my lust of my pride, of my fears to be mutilated. And then you think about the doctors who participate in that, exploiting all these people with mental health issues 
motivated by greed and power to take advantage of these people. And then you think about the politicians and the list goes on and on and on and all of society begins to break apart when human beings offer themselves to their gods, to their masters who lie to them and abuse them. And so we ought not ever to think to ourselves, you know what, I am the master of my life. That is just a lie. Every person has a master. You have a master. And the only question is, who will that master be? Will it be your epithumias? Will it be the devil? Or, or will it be the Lord Jesus Christ? And see, the solution in verse 13, look at verse 13. The solution is clear, and do not offer any parts of it to sin as weapons for unrighteousness, but as those who are alive from the dead. This is who we are. We are dead to sin and alive to God. As those who are alive from the dead, what does he tell us to do? Offer yourselves to God. I love this. And all the parts of yourself to God as weapons for righteousness. He's like, what you do is you don't take your hands and offer your hands to your greed or your lust or your bitterness. But day after day, you say, Lord Jesus Christ, you have my hands and you have my mouth and you have my intellect, whatever intellect is there, you have my intellect and you have my feet and you have my money and you have my relationships and you have my family, you're Lord of all and I want you to reign. And what Paul says is when you live that way, you know freedom. You know, you become more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think this is one of, the most the one of the most thrilling truths in all the world, that the God of the universe, the Lord Jesus Christ, he wants to live his life through us. He wants to live his life through us. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10 says, we always carry the death of Jesus in our body so that the life of Jesus may also be displayed in our body. Verse 11 for we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. Why? So what Paul's saying is, listen, we're not living according to our slave masters. We're not living for ourselves. But we're giving ourselves day by day over to death. We're saying, I am dead and I'm going to live like a dead person. Why? So that Jesus' life may also be displayed in our mortal flesh. So then death is at work in us, but life in you. And what Paul is saying is, he says, when you, when you empty yourself of yourself, the life of Christ comes through you, is lived through you. I mean, what a beautiful thought, that your hands can become the hands of Christ in the world. I mean, your, your words, you, you can, instead of destroying people, insulting people, gossiping about people, that your words can be used by the Lord Jesus Christ to give life, to strengthen, to encourage. That, that our money, instead of just being used for our, for our own ambitions, can be used to advance the kingdom of God. And so Paul says, listen, do you, do you sense the opportunity we have when we turn away from our slave masters and we turn to Christ, the one who died for us? The one who lived for us, the one who rose from the dead, the one that we have been resurrected with and will be resu resurrected with. And so he says, don't, day by day, don't offer yourself to your sin. Offer yourself day by day to God. And so many of you, you live that way, and praise God for that. It's a beautiful picture. But as a church, we have to be reminded that, that life is not about a set of behaviors. Now, there are Christian behaviors. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying, it's that, that's not fundamentally what, it, what it's about. It's about you trusting God. It's about you looking at the Lord Jesus Christ in the face, saying, you're my Lord, you're my master, here's my life. And it gives us a chance at an integrated life. An integrated life. It, it gives us the opportunity to live consistently with who we are. I, I learned recently about the, the word sin in German. It's the word sundre. I'm sure Germans don't say it like that, but that's how, you, how it's spelled, sundre. And we have a, an English word similar to it. It's asunder. What God has joined together, let no man put to sunder. Asunder. It, it means to divide. 
It means to break into pieces. And I think that is a good picture of sin. What does sin do? You're created in the image of God. You're created for the glory of God. You're created to know God. And what sin does is it, it, it fractures the inner person. It divides the inner person. And, and you experience that when you sin. You experience the division. That's why you don't feel joy. That's why you're not thrilled about it. That's, that's why you, you don't want to go out, if you're a Christian, you don't want to go out and brag about your sin. You experience shame because there's this fracturing of the inner self. But see, what Christ has done for us is he's made us new. The old man, dead. But we're alive in, in Christ. We have a new life in Christ. And now Paul's saying, be who you are. Be who you are. Live with integrity. Live consistently with who you are in Christ. And let the life of Christ come out of you. It's a beautiful thing. But brothers and sisters, we must, we must be the type of men and women day by day, by the grace of God, who just keep offering ourselves to him by his grace. We'll stray away from that and we come back. Oh God, today, today, you have my hands. You have my words. Oh, but I'm afraid. Don't give in to that slave master. That is a cruel master. But I'm selfish. That's a cruel master. Say yes to the master who gives you life. Let's go ahead and pray. Father,